Hello, hello, hello. How are you guys doing today? Okay, so another serious video over here. I promise, I promise the fan flipping, the singing, the intro will come back. Um, but today, this is something that I really want to talk about. Um, and yes, I will be talking about Colleen Ballinger, but I'll be talking a lot about a lot of other things as well. Um, the idea of believability of victims, the idea of carrying trauma throughout our entire lives based on things that happened to us one time, multiple times, however many times. Um, I want to talk about those things in relation to Colleen Ballinger, but also in relation to a documentary that I watched last night on Netflix called American Nightmare that was recommended to me by my best friend, Tanya Jean. She called me last night. She's like, you have to watch this documentary. I believe it just came out this week. So I sat right over there in that chair and I literally binge watched all three episodes of this documentary. And as I was nearing the end of this documentary, I was like, okay, it's interesting where my head is going to. I was going to stories that my mother told me um, about her childhood and her growing up. I was going to things that had happened to me as you know, I was growing up and, and before I got sober and things like that. And I was thinking about, for some reason, Colleen Ballinger. I think I was like looking up, somebody kept on tagging me and saying that like, oh, they were watching Adam McIntyre's video and then they were coming over and watching my video, which I appreciate. Adam has reacted to a lot of my videos and I really appreciate that. And whenever he does, a lot of people come over and they watch my videos and they say hi from Adam's channel, which I really, really appreciate. So to all you muckers out there, hey, welcome. How are you doing? Um, I think that Adam right now is doing <laughs> around the world in 80 days. He's going from one European city to another living his best life as he should um so you know i was like thinking i, I like i went over to his channel because i was like did he react to one of my videos i don't think i've done a coin video in 24 hours maybe i don't know the last coin ballinger video i did um was where i talked about trisha paytas in her podcast uh, talking about a Colleen Ballinger and coming back with her podcast and things like that. And um, so I was like, I don't think there was a, that was a video that Adam would respond to, but Adam himself was actually, I think, responding to that. I'm going to watch that video later today. So anyway, um, maybe he did. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I, if he did, thank you, Adam. I appreciate it. But I, I didn't even click on the video, but I saw that he was talking about Colleen Ballinger. And, you know, I was thinking about, like, uh, you know, this whole idea of Adam and Becky and Oliver and what they've gone through and sharing their stories online, you know? And in relation to this documentary that I was watching and the fact that it's about, well, I'll explain to you what, what it's about in a second, but it's really about the fact that nobody really believes what happens to these two people, especially to this woman. And um, the whole idea of how media has uh, really kind of played a huge part into the believability factor, you know? And, it, and to be honest with you, as I was watching it as a drama commentary channel, you know, it really made me think about, it, it, was, a good, it was a good documentary for me to watch as a drama commentary channel and how I cover things, right? And, um, and, and what I talk about on this channel and things like that. And it was really talking about the believability factor when we talk about victims, you know? Um, and so the whole thing was interesting to me as I was watching it. And it even made me feel more for the victims of Colleen Ballinger as Colleen Ballinger is now coming out and she is continuing to say things, you know, like talking about made up stories and she continues to reiterate these things that, you know, that people, uh, you know, made up about her and the lies and manipulation and things like that, right? And she's playing the victim in this whole situation. And that's to lead her fans to believe that she did nothing wrong at the expense of continuing to hurt the people that have already been hurt at the hands of Colleen Ballinger. So what it makes you wonder is, you know, and yesterday I titled my Natalia Grace video, something to the effect of, so if you didn't watch my video from yesterday, which was a very serious video, I did a video um, talking about the two part series, The Curious Case and Natalia Grace. And then the second series, and I talked a lot about her diagnosis of reactive attachment disorder and how I felt that the production and the um, the team of producers and the director and things like that really sensationalized the story of Natalia Grace at, Grace at her expense um, and that basically everybody around her has failed Natalia Grace. And then I compared the stories of Natalia Grace to Gypsy Rose Blanchard and how Gypsy Rose Blanchard is, you know, getting all this attention and stuff like that and 
and um, that Natalia Grace is basically painted as this evil, horrible person. Natalia Grace never murdered anybody. The worst that she was accused of was um, standing at the end of somebody's bed with a knife, a, a bed that she couldn't even reach the mattress on, you know? And Gypsy Rose Lee, Gypsy Rose Lee, <laughs> Gypsy Rose Blanchard, not Gypsy Rose Lee. Gypsy Rose Blanchard is being lifted up. And, you know, I got some comments in my last couple Gypsy Rose Blanchard videos and people are like, she didn't come right out of the gate and have a social media following. Are you kidding me? She literally posted her first selfie on Instagram and people went crazy, you know? And then you have this other girl, Natalia Grace, that um, had a horrific childhood as well, and people are painting a very picture, a very ugly picture of her based on the production of the TV series. And so, on the heels of me talking about that, I'm watching this documentary about this couple, and um, and how the media is really, the media and this one specific police department is really playing a huge part into... Um, the believability and painting this horrible picture of this victim. Painting a horrible picture of this victim, you know? And calling her the gone girl, whatever, and all this kind of stuff, and, and saying that it was a hoax that she created. And at the same time, you, then you find out that she went through this horrific thing. I'm going to explain this to you in just a second. And this will not ruin the documentary for you, because there's no way I could, because to hear it in their own voices is just so profound, right? So, you know, and so I was like comparing all this in my head and there are several different kinds of videos that I do over here, you know? I do like funny haha -ha videos where I just talk about my life. Um, I do like topic videos where if something happens, you know, like, you know, Michaela Nagara or Jacqueline Hill does a non-disclosed sponsorship. By the way, speaking of which, I just want to say this, that I was like looking through Instagram last night and Jessica Braun, who I've talked about a few times on my channel, she also lives in Indianapolis, Indiana, where I do. And um, I called her out one time for non-disclosing an affiliate ad on Instagram. She, like, somebody must have sent it to her in my video because she commented on the video. She turned around. She apologized on Instagram. She said she wouldn't do it in the future. And I was like looking on her Instagram last night and I'd, I'd sent her a message about two months ago or something on Instagram and I said, thank you for always like being a good example or whatever. And she was like um, showing things that she had got at Amazon. And it, like I looked at it and like right underneath it, okay, I mean exactly how it's supposed to be done. Didn't say hashtag ad hidden down in the corner and that kind of stuff. Right underneath it it, it was like, if this was like the cup right underneath it, it said affiliate. I was like, why is this so hard? Thank you, Jessica, for being such a fantastic example of how to disclose affiliate ads, you know? And then I go over to Jaclyn Hills, and of course, Jaclyn Hills, you know, listing affiliate links to Stanley Cups and things like that. No disclosure whatsoever, right? So explain to me why Jaclyn Hill, and there will be a longer video coming with this because I have all the screenshots and the receipts. Explain to me why Jessica Braun has no problem disclosing affiliate codes whatsoever, okay? And a lot of people actually do, do it appropriately. And then... Jacqueline Hill and all these people and then Manny MUA has the nerve to get in a podcast with Laura Lee and say that he can't stand people that don't disclose appropriately when Manny doesn't disclose appropriately and neither does Laura Lee and neither does Daniel Prada and they're all three good Judies. Make that make sense. So that would be an example of like a topic video that I would do. And then I have concept videos, okay? It's very it's very serious over here in the in the drama commentary world of Peter Mon, okay? Like, it's so serious that I have a diet, so they didn't have diet, pep diet pepper, they didn't have diet coke at the gas station the other day, so I had to get diet Dr. Pepper, which I actually love equally, but I forgot how much I really, really love it until I got it home and I was having one that night watching Vanderpump Rules, which, by the way, I've decided I'm now on season six, like, almost, like, a third of the way through it. They should never have called Vanderpump Rules Vanderpump Rules. They should have just called it Cheaters Point 2, 2.0, because it is just all about all these people being cheaters is what it is. But anyway, Anyway, so I'm in the kitchen and I open my can I, I'm like, I'm supposed to do that on camera, damn it! You're a professional, Peter! So this is a concept video, some things that I just want to talk about. So I'm watching this documentary last night called American Nightmare. And before I get into this, I just want to say that I put up something on Twitter last night about how I'd watch this documentary and it was so profound and things like that, right? And I got a bunch of DMs from people. Well, a lot of people like were messaging me and, and tweeting me and saying that they wanted to watch it. They heard it was really, really good and all this kind of stuff. And then I got uh, um, people that were saying that the documentary was promoting this idea that all cops are bad, okay? That is not um, something that, that is not a belief that I endorse or I believe in, okay? I just want to make that very, very clear. Do I believe that some cops are bad? 
Absolutely. Do I think that some cops are fantastic? Absolutely. Do I believe that some attorneys are good and bad? Yes. Doctors? Yes. YouTubers? Absolutely. Influencers? Of course. Hosts at Walmart? Some are bad, some are good, right? And that's kind of how I look at the world, right? I think that the world that we live in, that there can be really unethical, horrible police officers, and at the same time, there can be amazing police officers as well, you know? Um, and what's interesting to me is if you watch this whole documentary, it shows that range, you know? And I don't know anything about this director. I know he was like a wrestler or something came out with that. I've never watched that documentary. I don't know anything about his history. So if he's problematic, I am not aware of that. All I know is that this documentary was profound, okay? But if you watch it, what you find out is that it shows this one police department, okay, that really has their own agenda and their own motive, okay, for really directing the, the attention to this one couple. But then you have who, in their own words, they define this police officer um, as a hero. They say that she's a hero and that they were always looking, she was always looking for a hero is what this woman says. And that part, I'm just like literally bawling, right? So that's not necessarily the perception of the documentary if you watch all the way through, but I just wanted to make that clear. So the documentary, is it's it's three parts i literally binge watched it like right that i mean it was so good and it's about this guy and the first part is all him telling it and he and i'm not going to ruin it for you but i'm just going to give you a brief over idea of what it's about over idea i'm gonna give you a brief idea of what it's about okay so he and his girlfriend were asleep and supposedly these people broke in to their house and there was and i'm not going to get into the details of all of it because i don't want it to be ruined for you if you're a lover of true crime documentaries out there but there were a lot of like very specific things that happened and then they kidnapped his girlfriend so he goes to the police department calls the police department comes to the police department the police department like from the get-go does not believe him okay they think that it's it's him doing it so then it goes through the whole thing and, you know, oh, whatever. And the second part is her sharing her story of what happened. And her story is, I'll, I'll let you watch that and find out. And then the third part is them really finding out what really, really happened. And you'll be very, very surprised. But as I'm watching this, I'm thinking to myself, because they really paint a very ugly picture of this woman, okay? And, you know, once she comes out and she shares her story of what really went down, what really happened, and how she is a victim, okay, in the situation, she tells the police officers her story, okay? The police officers do a kind of short example of that to the press. The press runs with this false story, okay? And then they paint this ugly picture that she is the creator of this hoax, so you have, I mean, it's, they show Nancy Grace, they show Anderson Cooper in there, they show all these people, they show Anderson Cooper after the fact, but Nancy Grace is speculating whether or not it's a hoax. You have major news outlets covering the story saying that this victim, okay, of what happened to her when she comes out and shares her part of the story, that she made the whole thing up, okay? That there's no truth to that, that the whole thing was based on the movie Gone Girl, they call her the, the Gone Girl hoax and all this kind of stuff. And literally, she can't even leave her house because she can't work. They don't want her to come back and work because she's the hoaxer. And so she has this horrible reputation at the expense of all this kind of stuff. And she was a victim in a horrible crime that was committed against her. Okay? And I'm sitting there and I'm watching all this kind of stuff. And I'm thinking to myself, especially when they show this woman at the end that they, she identifies as the hero. And I'm sitting there watching and I'm thinking to myself... As I just like had seen this, you know, Adam McIntyre covering the Colin Ballinger thing again. And, and so many people will say like, Adam just needs to move on. He needs to shut up and quit talking about it. Patricia needs to move on. Always, you know, Becky and Oliver, they need to shut up. They need to like move on. Why? Why, why should they ever? Like, that's their right. Colleen Ballinger still talking about it in videos. And the Colleen Ballinger fans who are defending her and coming for the victims and telling the victims that they need to shut their mouths. They don't have a problem with Colleen Ballinger sliding into it in a vlog so that she can get more than 40 or 50,000 views in a video because people will go there to watch it because they know that she's going to address the situation, okay? Which for her is marketing because the last time that she did it was her talking about the podcast coming out. And now she has restarted the podcast with her husband, all right? So can you explain to me, all you Colleen Ballinger fans, how you don't have a problem with the fact that Colleen Ballinger continues to talk about it but the victims aren't allowed to talk about it because what you're saying is you believe Colleen Ballinger, all right? When there is factual evidence out there that this occurred to these victims at the hands of Colleen Ballinger, factual evidence, and you continue to choose to just believe 
what Colleen Ballinger is feeding you because you love Colleen Ballinger so much. Let's just put that in the real world, okay? So I'm watching this show and I'm thinking, if this happened to anybody that I knew, right? If this happened to anybody that I knew, and this wasn't just a documentary that I was watching, I don't even know what to think. Consoling, I mean, I've had friends of mine that have gone through horrific situations in their life and, and you know, I can't even imagine, you know, having at the same time to deal with the fact that nobody's believing you over what is happening and what's going on. I can't even imagine that, you know? And so I'm sitting there and I'm watching this and I keep on going back to the victims and what it must be like, you know, for the victims. And I'm reminded of the story of my mom. In fact, at one point, because she, she talks about S.A. in this documentary, right? And the police officer tells, this is when she's missing. And the police officer who's in charge of this case, who later, well, I'll watch the documentary, you'll find out later what happens to him. Um, but he tells the mother, because the mother shares that she has a history when she was in her youth, her childhood, um, she shares a story later, too, that she had um, uh, an incident of S.A. that occurred in her childhood. And so the police officer says to the mother, okay, imagine saying this to the, the mother of a victim, right? He says, speculating where she is, that many, and I have, to be honest with you, I have never in my life ever heard this. If this is true, I am completely unaware of that. I've never heard this before. That many S.A. victims recreate the scenario that they went through. I mean, I, I mean listen, I... You know, I read the Margaret Atwood short story when I was in college. I've heard about the fantasy thing and things like that, that, you know, from therapists and things like that. But on the level that somebody would recreate and, like, go missing and, and, and hoax a kidnapping to replay over for fantasy of S.A. in their own mind, this police officer insinuates that, right? Which they don't ever really address the fact that he insinuates. I mean, it's so disgusting. It's, it's re-traumatizing the victim. And they don't even know where she's at at this point. So the mother is concerned about her daughter, okay? This daughter that has never gotten in any trouble, that is just a fantastic human being, all right? And the police officer is insinuating that she is doing this hoax, okay, of being kidnapped because she wants to recreate her own SA to be able to relive it for fantasy reasons or something like that. And I'm, I'm sitting there watching it and I'm like, okay. So I've shared the story in my vlog quite a bit and I probably shared it on this channel as well. It was something that my mom was pretty vocal about throughout her, the end of her life towards, I would say the last 10 or 20 years. Um, when my mom, my mom developed very, very young, and I just want to say, there were a lot of people yesterday on my Natalia Grace video when I was talking about, like, her having a period and pubic hair and things like that, that a lot of people shared very, very openly stories of their own life and what they had experienced or through their children or people that they knew and things like that, or people said they were nurses or doctors. And I just want to say, I really, really, sh I really, really appreciate you sharing that because it gives us, it gives validity to the story of Natalia Grace. Um, and I really, really appreciate that. Um, and a lot of people were sharing that. And I was not aware of this. This is their just disorders and, and syndromes that cause um, some girls to begin menstruation at a very young age. Um, and I, I was not aware of that. My mother began um, breast development and at a very, very young age. Not six, seven, but for her, what was the young age? Because my aunt was, I believe, my, I, I can't remember how it went. But anyway, my mom was pretty fully developed by the age of like 12, 13. 12, I think, 13. And my mom was very big breasted. I've talked about that a lot in my, in my videos. It was something my mom talked a lot about. My mom's biggest dream in her life was to have a breast reduction. It was so painful for her. Um, and she just was very embarrassed of it. She felt like men were always looking at her breasts and things like that. And actually, when she got sober, my mom never wore V-neck T-shirts before that. When my mom got sober, she started wearing V-neck T-shirts. And she would say, if they want to look at my breasts, they can look at my breasts. I don't really care. You know, at this point, well, I, I just want to live my life. You know, I want to be comfortable in my own skin and I want to be free. And that was one of the things that sobriety gave to my mother. She got sober six months after I did. So my mother and I were able to share the last 12 years and 11 months together sober because she died a month shy. Well, not even a month shy, three weeks shy of her 13-year uh, sobriety birthday. And it was the greatest gift besides my birth that my mother has ever given me. Um, and so, you know, her sobriety gave her a lot of freedom. But my mom would share the story that when she was, I believe, 12 or 13 years old, 
her stepfather found boys peeking in her window as she was changing one night. And, you know, this, at that time, my mom was born in 43, so she would, if, if she was 12, you know, it would have been, what, 55, 1955, 1956. Let's just put that in perspective of what the culture and society and the world was like in 1955, 1956, okay? I think it was scary times, you know? And, and I think one of the saddest things to me at 51 years old is that much of my youth, you know, and I'm not talking about 10, 12, I'm talking about my 20s, I'm talking about even my 30s, you know, was spent seeing a lot of progress and a lot of change occurring in this world to now see a lot of it going away. And it makes me very, very sad, you know? And, I, and it's one of the reasons why, in all honesty, I'm glad that my mother isn't here because a lot of the things that have happened in the last 10 to 15 years, I think would have just broken my mother's heart, you know? But you gotta think about that time period, you know? 1955, 1956. Different time than we live in today in 2023. You would hope, right? And so the police officer, you know, comes out. I guess my mom's stepdad scared the, the boys away with a shotgun and whatever. And so the police officer comes out to take a report. <clears throat> my step, um, my, my mom's stepdad and her mom were standing there and, um, the police officer starts, you know, asking the situation. She's like, I looked out the window and these two boys were looking inside. My mom's stepdad shares that he went outside with a shotgun, you know, like whatever. And that they ran away and whatever. At that moment, the police officer started questioning my mother. And the questions that he asked her were, um, what is your breast size? Um, what size bra do you wear? Do you wear an appropriate size bra? When you go to school, do you wear tight sweaters? Do you wear tight sweaters to entice the, the boys? What do you do at school to entice the boys? Do you show the boys your breasts? He asked her this broad range of questions, okay? Which my mother carried with her her entire life. Literally until about two, three years after she got sober was when she started wearing V-neck t-shirts. My mom got sober at 51 years old, okay? So you're talking until my mom at 12 years old, all the way from 12 to 53 or 54, my mom would wear a lot of turtlenecks, baggy sweater. She always covered herself up. She was always embarrassed and ashamed of her breasts. She felt like people were looking at her breasts. She felt like people were judging her for her breasts her entire life. That occurred to her one incident, one hour of one night when she was 12 to 13 years old. One night. And I'm watching this documentary of this woman that has lived this horrific atrocity of what she's gone through, right? And nobody is believing her. Not one person, okay? Until this one woman out there, this one police officer, like, is like, oh my God, like, I figured this whole thing out, right? Thank God for this woman. I mean, you don't talk about heroes living on um, in this world. Like, this police officer, she is, like, unbelievable. You know, and she shows this range of emotion and things like that. I'm literally bawling my eyes out. My friend Tanya is calling me. She's like, are you done with it? I'm like, I got two minutes and 40 seconds left. Let me finish it. I'll call you back. You know, so I got done watching this, and I called Tanya up, and I'm talking to her, and then I get off the phone, and I just can't get out of my head the victims of Colleen Ballinger, you know? And I'm like... Colleen Ballinger is the American nightmare. She literally is, you know? I mean, we have a grown woman that has yet to take any accountability. You know, here's the thing for me, right? Okay. I've said in previous videos what I thought Colleen Ballinger should do to rectify the situation, okay? Um, I said that she should give a personal and private apology to all the victims and their parents. I said, and that was what Adam McIntyre had asked for. I said that she needed to take a very long time off the internet, if not for good, okay? And work with therapists and really working at why she shouldn't do this. That I felt like she should come out and address this in some kind of way, even if it was a minute kind of apology or whatever, to allow the victims to move on, all right? Now let's talk about really truly how sick this woman is, okay? She is coming out now, and not one, not two, not three, not four, not five, but multiple, multiple videos hinting at the worst year of 2023, what happened to me, the gossip train, the, you know, that cry me a river, river play the victim, this is the worst thing that ever happened to me, I can't believe that I had to go through this because if it's made up stories, it's lies and whatever. She refuses to let it go, okay? The reason why, okay, it's, it goes so far past you know, instilling in her fans this factor of believability that takes away the credibility from the victims. Because what she's doing, again, is abusing her power. 
Colleen Ballinger, okay, by sending this message to her fans and people that are watching her and believing what she has to say, okay, there's factual evidence. It would be one thing if there was no factual evidence. It would be one thing if there were no group chats. If there would be one thing if there was no video of Becky on stage at um, the show. It would be one thing if Oliver didn't have any evidence, okay? But there is evidence. There is factual evidence. There's a plethora of factual evidence, okay? And she's acting like that doesn't exist. So what is she doing? She is further abusing her power by taking the believability factor that her fans have in her, okay? Just like much of the world has a believability factor in this documentary for the police, for Nancy Grace, for all these other national, international news sources, okay? Who should we believe? Well, we should believe the police. We should believe the news. And so this woman loses all credibility. Well, this is what she did to Adam McIntyre three or four years ago, okay? Is when she came out with her false apology and was working behind the scenes and got everybody to believe her instead of him. It was another abuse of power. This situation, again, this is where Colleen Ballinger really hasn't changed. And this is something that we really haven't talked about, okay? Is that she's abusing her power by getting the people that love her so much to believe in her side, all right? And just ignore, just ignore all the evidence that's out there. That's abuse of power, number one, okay? Number two, what she's, this is why these people should not have platforms, all right? If Colleen Ballinger didn't have a platform, you watch her if you're going to watch her, okay? But if she didn't have a platform and people held her accountable and she wasn't making money off her platforms, okay? And James Charles didn't have, I mean, James Charles coming out and people saying that he's talking to minors or talking to people doing age checks and his DMs on... TikTok and on Instagram again. I don't, first of all, know why we're even surprised by that, okay? Number one. Number two, the reason that he's able to do that is because he's able to have those platforms. If James Charles, because he had abused those platforms previously, all right, was not allowed to do that anymore, then there would be no interactions, there would be no abuse of that power, of that platform, okay? But that has continued to be allowed, right? All right, so... Further, the fact that she uses her power and she abuses her power in a believability factor that her fans will just believe anything that she says. So ignore the evidence. I'm not going to even address the evidence. I'm just going to say lies and things that were made up by me and her fans are going to nod their heads, okay? So they're going to believe a false story that has no evidence. If the victims have come out with all this evidence, Colleen, why don't you come out with evidence and back up your side of it? You're a grown adult. You should have that evidence. Oh, you do have the evidence. It's the victim's evidence, but you can't come out and address that because that shows you badly, right? But let's even go on further and talk about what a monster that Colleen Ballinger is, okay? What an American nightmare she really is. Is because not only that, but she continues to bring this up to market her podcast, to get views on her vlogs, all right? Because there's really no reason. She's not going to address it. She's not going to apologize to these victims anytime in the near future until she gets backed in a corner and then she might, right? She really is unable to do the right thing. So she's going to continue to do all this kind of stuff, right? So the only reason that she's coming out and she's addressing this in her vlog, she's the only reason she's doing these things. You know, apparently she made some a joke in the newest podcast that she said, uh, somebody sent this to me, that she said something to the effect of, um, well, I, I believe, like, I, I'm a believer in finding out the total truth or something about the truth, right? And, and this person sent it to me and was like, what a joke. And I'm like, I agree. Like, what a joke. Like... Okay, you believe in absolute truth? I mean, this is more of Colleen Ballinger just poking the bear like Adam McIntyre talked about. And if you continue to poke the bear, listen, okay? You're going to you're going to get it, girl. You are, okay? Because what is obvious now is that you are using the incident that happened to you. This is very similar. We got to remember this, okay? To James Charles, okay? Making fun of the allegations that were put out there against him and having a birthday cake that says, and you did it at my birthday dinner, okay? This is very similar to that when Colleen Ballinger gets in a video and she says, for views, that all these things are going on and she brings it up for views. There's no reason for her to get, listen, there are enough people asking Colleen Ballinger questions about the incident, about the victim. She won't address those questions. Why does she have to get in a video and address the question of, of her losing the Broadway show? I don't give a rat's ass why she lost that Broadway show. She should have lost that Broadway show based on her actions. She should. And if I was a director in a theater, I would never want to hire her either based on her actions and her lack of inability and her inability to come out and ever address the fact, okay? So there was no reason for her to do that. But what she did was she used that as a medium to continue to blame the victims. And this is very, very important. And the reason that this is important, and this is going to stop, so hold on a second. 
I wanted to, it was that 30 minute mark. I wanted to restart it before I got into this. The reason that this is really important is, and this is truly who Colleen Ballinger is at her core, okay, is not only is she unwilling to take accountability or address the things that are being said, okay, or even come out and give it, give it any kind of acknowledgement or whatever. She thinks she's so above it. Like, it's not just a rumor, okay, girl? There's literal factual evidence. So that's the first thing. She won't come out and address that. The second thing is she's abusing her power by getting her fans to believe her made-up story, okay? Colleen Ballinger's made-up story. Colleen Ballinger's lies by, by whatever she's saying. When Colleen Ballinger comes out and says, I lost this over a made-up story, there is no made-up story, okay? Unless she's talking about the green face versus the black face. But if she was... I believe she would have come out and said that. She wants people to speculate what's the made-up story. She knows a lot of people are going to talk about it. She knows a lot of people are going to come back and watch her videos. She can't hardly get a view on her channel to save a life right now, so this is what she has to do. And I said this, okay? I said this like two months ago, that this is what she's going to continue to do. She's going to spread it out in a vlog here, a vlog there, so she can make money off it. It's the only reason that people are watching Colleen Ballinger, except for her, I don't know, 2,000 devoted fans that, that literally thought it was the early Christmas present that Colleen Ballinger came back, Okay? So she continues to carry the story out. She continues to not address it. But the biggest thing that she does is by doing that as a grown adult, okay, that has hurt people in her life by her actions, is that she is continuing to re-traumatize over and over and over the victims by bringing it up, all right? Now, for those of you out there that are calling Ballinger defenders that are going to say, well, they keep on bringing it up. They have every fucking right. They're the victims. If they want to bring it up every single day, 100 times a day, that's their absolute right, Okay. I was watching this documentary. I've mentioned this before in a video, uh, and it was about the, the Ken and Barbie murders in Canada. And at one point, the, the one woman that was killed, there were videotapes um, of her, you know, the trauma that she went through. And the mother petitioned for the court and the police department to get rid, uh, to destroy those videotapes. And her reasoning behind it was that every time those videotapes were shorn, shown in court or a journalist saw them or whatever, every single time those videotapes were viewed, that it was her daughter having to be re-traumatized all over again, okay? And when you think about it in that perspective, it really is interesting, you know? And so every time Colleen Ballinger brings it up, right? Colleen Ballinger, it was the worst year of 2023. She lost, allegedly, she lost a Broadway show, okay? She lost millions of fans. She lost people that won't watch her videos anymore. She doesn't make the same kind of money. She's already said all these things, right? Okay, she took a lot of time off of YouTube. On and on and on, she says, I don't believe that half that's true. I think she was making a lot of money during that time, all right? But she said all that. She's lost some friends through it. On and on and on, right? She has the option to not ever talk about it again and move on. And in fact, I thought that would be the smart move that she would make originally when she first came out. I thought she'll make one video and she'll never mention it again, right? And if she really wanted to save her career, if she really thought that she was talented at all and she had any career, because she's obviously not as talented as she let the world think she was, that because she now needs to bank on this incident that happened to her, you know? On top of giving Adam, Becky, and Oliver an apology, she really should be giving them a paycheck as well because if it wasn't for this incident, nobody would be watching Colleen Ballinger anymore because if this incident had occurred, and she acted the way that she did and she didn't keep on bringing it up and she was just talking about rocks in her videos, nobody would be watching Colleen Ballinger, okay? If this had occurred and they came out and talked about it, even if people didn't believe them, because a lot of people do believe them, the majority of the people do believe them. In fact, if you don't, you're an idiot. You look like an idiot if you don't believe the victims. There's, there's factual evidence. How you can deny factual evidence is beyond me, okay? That's just like you have such fandom and love for somebody that you're unwilling to look at it. And don't sit there and say, Peter's calling his followers idiots. Now, my, my, the people that watch my videos are smart. They get it, okay? So thank you for watching my videos. I'm not calling anybody out there that, that watches my videos and sees the truth as an idiot. I'm calling people idiots that look at factual evidence in any situation, in any case that's going on in the world, and say the total opposite out of their love for that person, okay? I don't know, but to me, that seems rather foolish, okay? So, when you look at it that way, that Colleen Ballinger is choosing, as a grown adult that can't take accountability, to continue to re-traumatize her victims by bringing it up over and over and over. Because every time she does, she knows that people are going to talk about it. She knows that. 
And then Adam McIntyre gets to hear, well, you need to not make any videos about it. You need to let it go. Why should he let it go? Why should Adam McIntyre ever fucking let it go? First of all, if she never spoke about it again and never gave an apology, they have every right to keep on talking about it. They have every right to keep... You don't get to tell a victim how to act. You don't get to tell a victim how to handle their own trauma. You don't get to do that. Period. End of story. You don't get to define the journey for the victim that went through a traumatic experience. Period. End of story. And if you think you do, then maybe you need to look in a mirror because the world does not revolve around you. Okay? And it sure as hell doesn't revolve around calling Ballinger. You don't get to define how a victim lived experience goes through their own traumatic experience journey through the other side. You do not get to define that for them. Okay? If they want to talk about it every day for the next 40 years, that is their right. I hope they don't. You know, a lot of people are like, Adam McIntyre is making all these videos just to make money and blah, blah, blah. Cheers, Adam. Cheers. For what you fucking went through, I hope that you are staying in the nicest hotels and having the best time in Europe at the expense of Colin Ballinger's name. Cheers to you. Cheers to all the subscribers you've gained off of telling the truth on your story. Cheers to all the views that you've got. Cheers to all of it out there, okay? And I can tell you there is not... People want to say drama commentary channels are jealous of Adam McIntyre. I have not ever talked to one drama commentary channel, and I've talked to a lot of drama commentary channels since this has gone down. I haven't talked to one person that hasn't said exactly what I just said. Adam deserves everything, okay, for coming out and sharing this story. He deserves it all, all right? Let's not get that fucking twisted for one second. If there's one side that we, most of us, I would say the majority of every drama commentary, well, not every drama commentary channel I have ever talked to, I don't know about the ones I haven't talked to, but every drama commentary I've ever talked to, we all stand on the side of Adam McIntyre and the victims, all right? Let's not ever get that twisted. And let's not forget for one second that Oliver, okay, and Becky and the other victims are sharing what's going on. They're not getting any financial gain off of it. They're sharing their stories and getting eaten alive online. Why would they do that, okay? So you don't get to tell them what they do with their traumatic experience and the journey to healing. You don't get to tell them that, all right? You try to. You try to be cute and come and say things for them. But the thing that I've seen, especially from Becky and Oliver, I mean, I've witnessed it from Adam McIntyre, but he's one of my colleagues in the community, you know? So I've seen it from Adam McIntyre for the last three years. But one of the most amazing things that I have witnessed from Becky and Oliver and watching them just on Twitter is the growth, the personal growth that they have gone through since this whole thing came out, you know, and their lived experiences online and the amount of people that have helped, that they have helped, you know. I have seen so many people say, just to the two of them, thank you so much for sharing your story. They've said it to Adam tons, but it's different categories of different situations of what's happened to these people, you know. They're role models, you know, and the thing is, is that Colleen Ballinger, as a grown adult that cares about money, is using their traumatic experience that she is not willing to address as a marketing tool to try to get people to come and watch her videos, okay? She is willing to put people through relived trauma at the expense of making money and getting people to watch her videos and her podcast. So answer me this, Okay. Is Colleen Ballinger a horrible person? Is she the American nightmare? I don't know. That's something that you need to figure out. You want to continue to watch her videos, buy her merch, listen to her podcast? Do you, okay? Do you, boo. I ain't going to do all that, all right? I'm not going to do that at all. I'm not going to do I know where I stand on this issue. Do you? Anyway, let me know what you think in the comment section below. I love you guys, and I will see you tomorrow. Bye.